Texas Farm Report, a rural area public relations program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this listening area and others interested in seeing the farmer receive a fair price for what he produces. Now here's the president of the Wilson County NFO, Herschel Ligon. Welcome to another NFO program from Nashville, Tennessee. I live in the Green Hill community in Wilson County, near the Hermitage. My farm overlooks Old Hickory Lake. Along with my father, my boys, Bill and Jim, I am a breeder of registered Poland China hogs, registered Pole short on cattle, registered Hampshire sheep, and I've always had Jersey cattle. My farm has never belonged to anybody but the family. It was deeded from the government of North Carolina. My father's house is the oldest inhabited building in Wilson County. It was built in the first administration of George Washington. Since returning from World War II, my total income has come from farming. And I don't mind telling you, there have been some years that the expenses have been more than the income. Uh, that's my total income, too. Uh, that has come from, from farming, and it's been pretty rough. Uh, NFO, I'm sure, is something that a lot of people watching today have never heard of. NFO is the abbreviation for National Farmers Organization. And it is just exactly what the name implies, a national organization of farmers. NFO came into being through necessity. In the Midwest, there is town after town that depends on agriculture for its entire income. When it got to where the farmers didn't have enough money to buy what they had to have, they had to do something. It wasn't like here in Tennessee where they could get a job in a factory, get the wife a job in a factory, because factories are scarce up there. They're not as many and as close together as they are down here. So one day a farmer and a feed salesman got together and decided they'd try to do something about the farm problem. They decided to have a meeting. At meeting they, they had people that came, oh they were just amazed that the number of people came to the meeting. They decided to have another meeting. And at the next meeting people came from all directions. From these meetings they decided to go to Washington as a legislative protest group to see if they could get something done about the family farm situation. In Washington, they found the Capo Volstead Act, which authorizes collective bargaining. Incidentally, this Capo Volstead Act was passed by Congress in 1922. Under uh, collective bargaining under the, in the Capo Volstead Act, we farmers through National Farmers Organization get contracts signed with processors of meat, milk, and grain for our production. We, we contract this production at a price that will cover cost of production plus a reasonable profit. That is what all other businesses do. They always have and always will if they stay in business. But we farmers haven't been doing that. We've been going to the marketplace, what will you give me? And every time we buy something, we have to give them what they want for it. So that is what is brought on NFO. Today, NFO is no longer the militant upstart organization that it once was. Today, NFO is a major farm organization. NFO has more farmers in it than any other organization in the world. They are organizations that have more members, but we have more farmers because a person has to be a farmer to be a member of NFO. A person can't hold office in NFO unless they make at least 51% of their total income from farming. So that, I hope, brings you up to date a little bit on NFO. Today we have some very interesting people with us, intelligent people, people who know their professions, and I'm sure you're going to get something out of what they have to say. We have a minister. We have a banker. We have a mayor. And we have an implement dealer. On my extreme right is Elder Kenneth Pinkstaff, pastor of the Arbor Primitive Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Tennessee, and incidentally, uh, Elder 
pink staff has known something about NFO for quite a while. He is a member of NFO. He is also a businessman. And uh, he had some interesting experience with our national president a year ago. Elder Pinkstaff, let's start this thing off by what do you think the family farm contributes to society? In other words, boys and girls reared on the family farm, what do they contribute to our society? Mr. Lincoln, I have uh, certainly have had much experience in the last 20 years uh, with the farm family because primarily I've served in farm areas, building churches and rendering public service. The farm family indeed is known and today is still the backbone of America, not only in character but in honesty and in the ability to do hard work and to produce from the God-given earth the, the uh, necessary needs of, of food uh, that all of us must have for the issues of life. It's been my uh, good pleasure to, uh, to see and to have worked with many farmers. Many times have I shared with them in their losses. For a number of years, the farm family has been to a disadvantage because they have not been organized together as a band of people. And certainly life itself will uh, give to us an example that it takes unity in anything to be able to bargain and to bring about the fair price or the fair answer to any problem. So indeed, I, I think that America must reach out and help the rural farmer, the small farmer, uh, to maintain his livelihood and to be able to do this without having a part-time operation. Uh, just what kind of employee will a boy or a girl reared on the farm make an employer? Well, there again, I've uh, had the experience of being juvenile judges down in Georgia where I had uh, pastorates. Uh, I love children, and certainly our boys and girls are indeed the future of America. But there's no doubt about it that one great man once said that if a boy loves the earth, if he loves the, the forest, if he loves to fish, that this boy, in, uh, in percentage-wise, or girl, will never give you the trouble that the boys and girls have in the cities where their time is not employed. I think the characters of the boys and girls that grow up on a farm when they become age, that they can uh, begin to work and take their responsibilities from the farm laborers. They learn uh, to uh, secure in life by working what they so desire. And uh, also, I think that the rural farm family, uh, by far, can be the closest family that we have in America today because when the man and wife works in the city, which with the high cost of living like it is today, uh, they're separated from their children. Where the farmer and his wife can maintain a livelihood by fair bargaining and good prices for their products, then they can be with their children, the children can be with them, as in your case on your farm uh, here in Wilson County. In other words, this part-time farming doesn't work out so well as far as the family is concerned. Well, I live in a small county down in Moore, which we think is one of the garden spots, and I'm sure all of these men on the panel here today think their homes are. But we have uh, limited factories there, and uh, it, to my knowledge, uh, there in Moore County, uh, many of our farmers have to resort to working at night shift or working a part-time job, or their wife is working in a factory to maintain farming. And to me, as a minister and as a businessman, I do not think this should be. If a man uh, is a farmer, he should be able to make a living uh, with his products and uh, with his labor, and he shouldn't have to, to work uh, over hours and extend his family to work in order to farm to feed we Americans. This is just my opinion, and I hope the rest of the public uh, will agree with me. In other words, the farmer should get out of his business like any other businessman gets out of his. Uh, true, this is uh, so. Uh, I think that any of us would agree that uh, any businessman who is losing money and can't survive will certainly dispose of that business, or the business will dispose of him one. And this has been the... Uh, Trouble in farming, especially since the small farmer uh, has been decreasing, it's the fact that he can't survive. And the, the larger farmers, of course, are having their problems too. And uh, I certainly am in accord with NFO because, I, as you stated, uh, later on, if we have time permit, I will give you some of my experiences with the president and with um, many of the workers. And I, and I certainly believe that this is the answer uh, to our problems on the farm. 
One more question for you here. Uh, as we all know, uh, if NFO doesn't move fast, the corporate farm is going to take over. In other words, farming is going to be done by corporations and everybody farming there will be hired labor. If that takes over, just how will that affect rural churches? Well, certainly this is a fear that I have, uh, not only in farming, but in all fields of endeavor. It's already hitting the businessman, the small businessman in the small communities are uh, being swallowed up. Uh, this is true in farming. If we allow the big farmers to buy out the little farmers, this means that the small communities will soon become plantations and will be a, a desolate. Uh, the churches can't survive because all of us know that it takes people, finances, to carry on our schools and our churches. And I really feel that the answer is to, to help the small farmer and to keep him on the farm and uh, thus to help the small communities because after all, we all can't be metropolitan New York and we must remain Moore County, must maintain our population. I'm past president of the Chamber of Commerce there and we've been alarmed to uh, the very fact that the small farmer, because of the income, when, the, when his son or daughter comes to the age of marrying, they're marrying and leaving the small communities and actually, we have them while they're a liability. The city is getting them when they can be an asset. And this is what I'd like to see, not only in farming, but in all businesses, to maintain and bring back our liabilities that once were and return them into an asset for us. And you know, most boys and girls have farming in their hearts, but uh, they, they have to leave because they can't make a living. And when somebody's doing something that they don't uh, love, they're not as happy as they would be if they were doing what they love. Well, I certainly agree with you. And just brief for the statement, uh, I used to remember down in Lincoln County where I was born, the summers I spent with my grandfather on the farm, and I believe any man that believes in the great supreme architect just loves every once in a while to get down there and look at that good earth and appreciate it and ride out and see the beautiful pastures. And I think that this is certainly, uh, there is a much need for the younger uh, men to go into farming as a profession. And then in order to do this, the farm has got to give them an income that is equal to other incomes that they can receive in other businesses. There's one uh, person that the farmers have to get along with. I know if it hadn't been for my banker, I don't think I'd be farming today. Next on our panel is, is our banker, Jim Walker, president of First National Bank from Centerville in Hickman County, Tennessee. Jim? How are farmers on paying their debts if they have income? Mr. Ligon, <clears throat> farmers are among the best credit risk of rural banks. Farmers as a whole retired more debt in 1965 than in any of the previous five years. This was due to increased income from higher prices received for corn, uh, hay, cattle, and hogs in 1965. In my opinion, the farmers are handling their gross debts in a very excellent manner. NFO is to be commended for their assistance to farmers in raising farm income. When agriculture is depressed, it is not only farmers who are affected. When prices of agricultural products and income of farmers fall, many banks, service establishments, and commercial establishments of other types in rural areas are soon affected. Before very long, producers of agricultural machinery fertilizer and other items which farmers buy in large quantities are affected too. Thus, when economic conditions in agriculture are not healthy, there are repercussions in various other aspects of the economy as well. And in some geographic areas, general economic well-being is highly dependent on the economic well-being of agriculture. Thus, to achieve a balanced economy, equal attention must be given to agriculture, industry, and service establishments. I have a few statistics I'd like to give on this. In 1958, over a million families on the farm, or about 25% of all farm, farm families, had income of $2,000 or less. Another 18% had incomes between two dollars and $3,000. Only about 7% of farm families had incomes of $10,000 or more. By contrast, on non-farm families, only 6% had incomes under $2,000. Another 6% of non-farm families had incomes between two dollars and $3,000. And 17% had incomes of $10,000 and over. 
Farm families constituted one-third, or 33 percent, of all families with income under $2,000, but only 5 percent of those with incomes of $10,000 and over. Thus, it is evident that a balanced economy is not in existence in rural areas unless some means can be adopted for improving farm income, such as those provided by NFO. In my opinion, Mr. Ligon, the farmers of America have never done a better job for which they got less pay. Most people think that, too. Uh, how much money do, do farmers spend with, with your bank and, and the people in which you do business? Farmers normally spend most of their income in the local trade area. Gross value of farm products sold in my county last year exceeded $3 million. Approximately two-thirds of that, or $2 million, was spent locally, or a half million more than in the previous year. This is about a third of the total gross sales in my county. The American family spends 19 cents of the family dollar for food. In 1949, it spent 26 cents. NFO bargaining prices should not increase that 19 cents by more than two cents. Should any marketing group or group of processors ever so act as to raise the price of food unduly, the housewives, through their coercive action, and the Secretary of Agriculture, through powers already vested in his office, would bear down to roll the prices back. The only business of the NFO is to go into the marketplace and come to grips with the farmer's number one problem, which is price. I believe the NFO is not competing with the small businessman and that the NFO fully realizes that a balanced economy is essential for continued progress of our society. As a matter of fact, every taxpayer should be interested in the continued progress of the NFO program since a larger income to farmers through collective marketing will result in smaller governmental expenditures for present agricultural support programs. It takes more money to farm in Tennessee now than ever before. Today, with capital investment per farm around $50,000, it is very difficult to get into farming without credit. With increased income assured, Lenders will be more readily available, I believe, Herschel, to meet the short and long-term needs of farm credit. That sounds real good. I have another question I'm going to ask you, but I'm going to go around and then we'll come back. On my left is the mayor of Lafayette, Tennessee, Will Hall Sullivan. Uh, Mr. Sullivan is also a farmer. Mr. Sullivan, what... Uh, what is a small farm to have if we're going to survive in the present economy? Well, uh, Mr. Ligon, I'd like to quote some figures. I don't want to bore you with statistics, but 30 years ago, I fought a desperate battle to get rural electric service available in Macon County and a number of other counties in the Upper Cumberland area had a war with the power company in which I believe you were employed at that time. Uh, we were fortunate in getting the cooperative organized. It's now grown to serve over 25,000 members in 10 counties. It's one of the largest in the nation. 16,000 of those members are farmers. However, the disturbing situation at this time is that it is estimated that there are over 2,000 empty meter sockets on the Tri-County system now. This represents farm homes that were wired and equipped in the last 20 to 30 years. Now they are abandoned, standing empty. The people have migrated away to the great cities of the north searching for employment because they couldn't maintain an adequate standard of living on the small farms such as we have. Now, an adjoining cooperative to us has counted their empty meter sockets. There's over 3,500. That's a staggering figure in an area of eight or 10 counties. The number of farm families in Macon County is steadily declining. The size of the farm is getting larger, partially due to mechanization and the change from row crop to grassland farming, and the fact that we are doing everything we can to get more industry into the area to keep 
the young people at home. In the late 30s, I realized that if the rural electric program was to succeed, we would have to have a strong national organization in Washington. I traveled over two thirds of the states of this great nation in organizing the NRECA, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, which we're fortunate to have the national president in Tennessee now, down from the banker's town, Mr. Paul Tidwell. That organization has been able, through the mass weight of numbers, the votes they could swing, to keep the program going, to provide funds not only for rural electrification, but for rural telephone service. From 1950 up to now, I've organized four telephone cooperatives, total investment of 20 or 25 million, covers a great area all across the north part of the state and over into Kentucky. But if the small farm is to succeed in our present day economy, then they must have strong and efficient farm organizations to represent them, both in the national, state, and county governments, as well as in the marketplace. Otherwise, the corporate farm would rapidly supplant them, forcing continued migration to urban areas, search of means of a livelihood. It's a serious problem, much more serious than the average small businessman in the average small town realizes, because his livelihood is leaving him too, as the rural people leave. If they're gone, they're gone. As someone mentioned a while ago, in some sections of the north central west, there's town after town with the doors swinging open in the wind. Not anyone lives there anymore. You might have seen the Brinkley Report program on that six or eight months ago. And only an organization is their strength today and the ability to cope with our present day economy. Thank you, sir. I have another question or two I want to ask you, but I want to get to our infamous deal over there and then we're going to come back. Over on my extreme left is Joe Clemens, who was a farmer for years, and I guess he got the way he couldn't make a living farming, so he started selling farm machinery. I don't know how he figured he could sell farm machinery and make a living when the farm didn't have any money, but incidentally, I know Joe has done well. He's been Alice Chalmers' dealer in Gladeville, Tennessee, in Wilson County for 14 years. I think he serves about five counties. Joe, I, I want to start out with a, with a straight question here. Okay. If the farmer can get just one thing, what is the one thing he needs most? Price for his products. Price for his product. A fair price, that is. And if he gets that price for his product, well, he can uh, he can buy what he wants to when he wants to. Uh, I'm basically a farmer, Herschel, and uh, pretty well uh, deep grass rooted. I operate my business on my farm that uh, I was fortunate enough to inherit, and it has been in our family approximately a hundred years. My father passed away about four years ago. In his lifetime, uh, I would say he was a mediocre farmer. He made money. He provided well for my sister and I, at least. And uh, being in uh, the machinery business was to suppl supplement farm income. Now, I can appreciate when a customer, and I'm speaking of a farmer customer, comes in my door and he complains of the prices being high, which they are high, but it's completely out of our control, the sooner that the dirt farmer, now talking about the gentleman farmer, the hobby farmer, I refer to myself as an overall farmer. The quicker that he gets in a better position financially, he gets his fair share of the product which he produces, I mean the fair uh, profit of it. I can pay a man to sweep out my shop and give him a better wage than I can hire that same man to get out there and work on the farm. And that's a disgrace for our economy. Now, 
I'm going to give the only statistics that uh, I have to offer was compiled by a major farm machinery manufacturing company, which is a competitor of mine. I think it's nothing but fair to call their name. Uh, International Harvester Company conducted a, uh, had a service uh, organization to conduct a, uh, a poll. They wanted to find out what was the matter. I'm sure my company uh, uh, caters to uh, finding out the trend of things. But International Harvester Company come up with this. There has been a decline since 1950 until the end of 1965 of 42% of the family farmer. Now the projected decline from now till 1975 will be another 43% at the present rate of decline. Now, here's what's happening. If, if the farmer all over America, he's quitting farming, I'm trying to farm, I'm trying to sell farm machines. When there's fewer and fewer customers walk in my place of business every day, what's going to happen to me as a farm machinery dealer and what's happening to me as a farmer? Not only does it happen to you, Joe, but uh, when you don't sell that farm machinery, that factory's not going to be making that machinery and some labor's going to get hurt. It all runs back to the fact that when a farmer spends a dollar, it multiplies into seven dollars nationally. That's right. Joe, uh, very interesting thing about Joe, I called him when we started signing NFO members in Wilson County. I said, Joe, we're signing up people in NFO. Joe said, yeah, I'll sign it. Come on up here. Well, as far as I know, Joe has never read the membership agreement yet. He just signed it. You signed it because you figured there's the only thing left for the farmer, huh, Joe? Absolutely. You, I, I, I know he believes that. Uh, originally, uh, I have a confession to make. Uh, I'd read just a little about uh, NFO, but very little. Not as well read today as I should be. A year ago, I figured, well, it might not work, but it would have its nuisance value. And uh, it's, it's even uh, gone beyond my expectations. It's something more than a nuisance value, I'll tell you that. I can see that every day. And, uh, but actually, I said anything is better than what we've got. Well, Joe, uh, you told me the other day, and I think this bears out just the type of people that farmers are. In the 14 years that you've been in business, you've had to make one repossession, and that repossession wasn't to a farmer, it was a man of another profession. Absolutely. So that just shows the kind of people farmers are. They, they're honest people. They're hardworking people. They'll pay the debts if they can get the money. But if they can't get the money, not only do they hurt, but everybody else hurts. Uh, you know, we have come along wonderfully in this thing. We're making great progress. Uh, got some good information this past week. It, uh, we're way along in meat. Uh, we had a big grain sale in 16 states last week. And our milk looks real good. Gentlemen, I'd like to remind you, uh, speaking of the good of the nation, what President Kennedy said. He says, don't ask what your country can do for you. Ask what can you do for your country. That's for us Democrats. For my good Republican friends, I'd like to quote Teddy Roosevelt. And this concerns people who are interested in farmers and who are supposed to be working for farmers. He says, Every man owes part of his time and money to the business or industry in which he is engaged. No man has the moral right to withhold support from an organization that is striving to improve conditions within his sphere. Gentlemen, I've enjoyed having you with us today. You've been a good panel, and if we'd have had more time, I'm sure we could have brought out a lot more good points. U.S. Farm Report, a rural area public relations program, was brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation. By members of the National Farmers Organization in this area, and by others interested in seeing the farmer receive a fair price for what he produces. This program was pre-recorded.